outside Biloxi in the Dowville area. Right now I'm living temporarily in my dad's home in the St. Martin area where Betty and her husband and a couple other members came to meet me that afternoon. And uh, tell us that my interest is, uh, <clears throat> in this area is the uh, professional baseball, uh, particularly Gulfport, but also we've had a little touch of it in Biloxi also. And uh, I'll uh, get into some of the names. The, uh, the early uh, Gulfport team went on in 1906, 1907, and 1908. Uh, the first two teams went on as the Gulfport Crabs. And the third team was known as the Gulfport Biloxi Sand Crabs. So, uh, that's what we got here. We got a little crab. <laughs> and in 1926, 27, and 28 team, also the Cop States League, the uh, Gulf War Athletic Association had a meeting after about 43 entries was, were set in, and they spent about an hour and they selected the name Tarpon. So that's the reason why we had the other name here. And uh, I've got a cap. <clears throat> this is what uh, passes for uh, Major League Baseball caps to this day and time. This is the Pittsburgh Pirates, and I'll send it around. It's called 59.50, that runs about $35, so we get a minor league team in here. New Era makes all the major league caps, and they also make all the minor league caps. So, uh, like I say, if, if you want to buy a professional baseball cap in this day and time, you deal with one company, it's New Era out of Buffalo, New York. <clears throat> but anyway, the uh, 1906 Gulfport team, uh, like I say, I found this out. The president was a man named Phil A. Dolan, and the manager was uh, a man named Early E. Miller. That team won 58 games, lost 61, and they placed fourth in the 16th league. And the uh, corporate name uh, that ran the uh, team was the Gulfport Athletic Association. And I've still got a lot of work to do on these early teams because unfortunately we don't have newspapers and microfilm down here. What I did find out, I told uh, Betty, I've got uh, three newspapers that are on microfilm up in Jackson. And somehow or another, we need to get copies down here where it's easier uh, for people to get access to it and do research like I'm doing right now. And anyway, those newspapers are the Gulfport Record of 1905 and 6. <clears throat> and then it becomes the Gulfport Daily Record Tribune in 1907 to 1908. And the last newspaper uh, that they have up there is the Gulfport Advocate in 1915 and 1917. And after about that time, the Daily Herald began to come over and provide coverage. Prior to that time, until back to about 1884, they were strictly a Biloxi paper. So you deal with that, you know. All right, going on with the, uh, the crabs, the uh, 1907 team uh, was, uh, the president was a man named W.D. Tatum. <coughs> and most of the time, these were members of the Gulfport Athletic Association. And they were a, a group or a club like this, and the members normally uh, rotated the, the presidency around. And, they also hired a, what was called a secretary at the time. In this day and time, uh, minor league baseball clubs, they have a general manager doing the same type job. But anyway, the man that ran the, t <coughs> the team as president that year was W. Uh, D. Tatum. I don't know who the secretary was. The manager, there were two of them, George uh, Leedy and Link Stickney. And uh, that particular team won 68 games and lost 67. And they placed fourth in the 16 league. And they, they were members of the Cotton States League. And the Cotton States League is about as low as you could get. <clears throat> I mean, you, in, in the minor league baseball, you had uh, below the major leagues, you had A, you had B, you had C, and then you had D. And that's what Gulfport and the Cotton States League were at the time. You know? And this held through through the 1920s. So uh, it didn't change all that time. Later on, about the 1930s, they developed a uh, Triple A and the Double A uh, uh, designation from minor leagues and uh, the Southern Association, where Mobile and New Orleans had teams for years, uh, became part of the Double A league in those years, so called the Southern Association. Anyway, in 1908, this is a particularly interesting year. The president of the team was a man named John R. Pratt. I found that out by reading the, the Daily Herald. It wasn't in the Cotton State League records. And the secretary was a man named D.J. Hare, and a manager was a man named Robert Gilks. And I've given uh, Betty copies of what I have in one of my booklets. And uh, these three teams, we have team pictures of them. And uh, Robert Gilks, I think he's also pictured as a manager in one of those, of those photos, <coughs> that early stuff. And I got all that from the uh, National Baseball Hall of Fame. They were kind enough to send me what they had up there, as far as the old uh, uh, balling guides and that kind of thing, baseball guides. They had pictures of a lot of these teams and they give a little description of what the team did during the year and that kind of thing. So you get just a little basic information, but 
majority of it either comes from local newspapers or the uh, uh, record book of the Cotton States League. I mean, they published a special anniversary issue in 1955, <coughs> and a lot of this stuff came from that. <coughs> anyway, in this particular year, the Gulf War team was having some financial problems, and uh, what I found uh, reading the 1920 papers, you had to have a baseball market of about 50,000 people to make a go of it in any level of baseball. And uh, you were dealing with cities at the time, Gulfport probably around 10,000 and Bucks in maybe 11 to 12. Even the two combined, I mean, you were well below 50,000. And uh, he, <clears throat> what they would do, uh, the athletic association <clears throat> would go around and visit with the business people in the community, ask for donations or whatever. And a lot of times the athletic association people themselves would uh, go into their pocket uh, to uh, provide enough uh, the money to, to run the team and get through the season. And uh, this was a time when there was no night baseball, there was no TV, no radio, but the only thing you had for us communication was uh, newspapers. And uh, to get back and forth between uh, Biloxi and Gulfport, uh, it was basically uh, trolleys. And uh, the Gulfport team played basically what they always did. Uh, what became known in time as the uh, Gulfport uh, Fairgrounds Ballpark. In the early days, I think it was just known as the Gulfport Ballpark. And there was a factory next to it that assembled engines and one thing or another. Later on, it became uh, a building used by the fairgrounds for uh, uh, exhibits and uh, also uh, boxing matches and this and that. And that. And those, those two stayed together until uh, both of them disappeared about the time of World War II and a little after. And uh, like I say, the, uh, the Gulfport Fair Association owned that particular block of property down until about 1927. I'm not exactly sure when they bought it and all of that, but anyway, the ballpark goes back to the earliest days in 1906, 1907. But in 1927, the uh, Fairgrounds Ballpark and all the land that went with it was sold by the Fair Association to the uh, city of Gulfport. And uh, later on, like I say, after the war, uh, Milner Stadium was built in 1947. And later on, I think the West uh, uh, end, uh, elementary school, I think, and some other things were built on the same property, but the, the ballpark itself, uh, about three quarters of the field there, it's in an empty lot today, and uh, a big part of the left field and center field areas down the southern end of Mil Milner Stadium, I've given uh, Sanborn uh, fire insurance maps to uh, Betty that, that proves that. But uh, like I say, the uh, Gulfport team pro approached the Biloxi baseball enthusiasts, if you want to call them that, and uh, they uh, they dreamt up the idea to have a joint team. The Biloxi, uh, I mean the Gulfport Biloxi Sandcrabs, that's what it was officially known as for the league. And uh, the, when they played their games in Biloxi, they, they played a split schedule in July and August of that year. About 12 games were played in Biloxi, and the rest of the schedule were played in Gulfport. And they played in a place in Biloxi called Point Comfort Park. And I spent more time trying to figure out where that place was. I had to go into the courthouse and do extensive land research to find out who owned property in this neighborhood. I mean, every property on around, about five or six blocks, I finally figured out where it was. If you know anything about Biloxi, you go up Oak Street toward the, the bay, you've got a, a block that sits there right on the bay, and then the one just south of that, off of Oak Street, uh, and between Myrtle Street and between uh, 9th Street to the north and 8th, 8th Street to the south, is where that park was. And it was quite a complex. The next few years, they built a, an amusement park complex and everything else, and along with the ballpark. And uh, I'm going to publish all this in booklets, but it, it's getting so much in depth. I've had to do about five or six of these booklets because you get so much information there, and you get so, you're just completely overwhelmed with it all, you know. But I'm getting that a little bit of the time, and I want to concentrate on uh, on go for it tonight. Anyway, at the end of the year, uh, the league was having problems. It wasn't just go for it, but Biloxi. Go for it, uh, they drew fairly well in Bluxy because they were brand new to the league. I mean, they drew extremely well. But uh, the league, league was having problems, and uh, they went out of business for a few years. And when they did, <coughs> Gulfport and Bluxy didn't come back when the, when the league resumed <coughs> in the next three or four years. It was 16 years until they fielded another team in, in the Cotton States League. And the Cotton States League was an old league. It went back to the early days of the 20th century and existed until 1955. Uh, and it basically uh, was in uh, Mississippi, uh, uh, Louisiana, and uh, Arkansas. 
And at the time the Crabs played there, I think them and Mobile were, were two teams in 1906 and 1907, uh, and that's in the, uh, uh, the geographical area of the league at the time. And Mobile, I can tell you quite a bit about them because I did a lot of research on them before I decided to take on the Gulf Coast. They joined the Southern Association in 1908 and replaced the uh, 314. And uh, when they did, like I say, go for it, became, uh, you know, the, uh, the, along with the orphan child out here, like I say, by themselves. And, but uh, the uh, Mobile team had won the pennant and Cobb States League in 1906 and 1907, so they had a powerhouse club. And they went into the uh, Southern Association and had, had summer results there, too. But anyway, it was 16 years before the uh, the Gulfport uh, the Athletic Association was reformed, and uh, in 1926 uh, they reformed the group and they bought the uh, Cotton States League team that had been in uh, uh, Brookhaven, Mississippi, and it came down here. And at that time uh, there were two teams in Louisiana, Alexandra and Monroe, Louisiana. It was Jackson and Meridian, and uh, uh, let's see, there was uh, Laurel and Hattiesburg and Gulfport down here at the other end. And uh, like I say, the president at the time was a man named V.A. Anderson. And this character had a plantation home in Louisiana. I guess he had business interest over here in town, so he was back and forth between the two. And my guess is when the, when the treasurer got low, he probably went into his pocket and probably kept his team alive for three years, I guess, when things got bad on the financial side. Anyway, the secretary of the club at the time in 1926 was a man named E.B. Causey. And uh, what I found in my own research, this is why I like to do newspaper research, and the Cotton States League uh, uh, <coughs> guide, or, or record book, they listed one man as a, as a manager, Henry Cotton Knopp. And uh, there were actually three. This was a young team that was formed at the last minute in March of 1926. They didn't have all the manpower and the finances. The other uh, five or six teams in the league did, so they were competing against all of that. And uh, I think uh, the people that uh, made up the Gulfport Athletic Association were really jumpy and worried about the feeling the team that was going to finish last. So they, they went and, and fired the first manager and hired two more after that. The second was Jack Ryan. He was hired on June 13th. And the last man was Clarence Nimitz on July the 13th. And uh, both of them were players on the squad. And these Class D clubs were something else. They had about 14 members uh, of each team. There was no such thing as a coaching staff and a manager and all of that. I mean, when you played with these teams, you played and you also managed. <laughs> then uh, a lot of the pitchers, they played other positions. So you, know, you had 14 uh, uh, men on these teams. The top salary, if they were paid that, was about $2,000 a year. And about half of that team had to be rookies. I mean, with no professional baseball experience at all, and uh, uh, two or three, I mean, they could be professionals that had been in other leagues for years, and the rest of them had, had somewhere in between that. So that was quite a quite a thing. And uh, like I said, uh, there was no such thing as night games where you could make <clears throat> money with, with people coming after work and that kind of stuff. And most of the crowds that came to watch these games were usually on Saturdays or Sundays, and most of the time it was on a Sunday because a lot of people worked on Saturdays. There was no, no TV, there was no radio, and there was almost funny reading about all of this way back there. The closest radio station you had at, at that time was WSMB out of New Orleans. And that's an affiliate of WWL today over there. It's a, it's a minor player in the, in the uh, radio market in New Orleans, but at that time it was the only player here in this region. <clears throat> so that's the kind of thing you were dealing with. And uh, I found the biggest crowds that these teams drew, uh, at least the Gulfport team anyway, was usually opening day. July the 4th, Easter if you had a game on a Sunday, and the closing day. And the rest of the year, you know, you'd have maybe 100, 200 fans there. And you needed, you needed two or three, two or three thousand each game in order to make a profit, you know. Well, anyway, the 1926 team, the first half, <coughs> they played two halves uh, at this time in the league. Uh, the team won 31 games and lost 31, <coughs> and they were fifth place in an eight-team league. The uh, second half, they won 26 and lost 36, and they came in eighth in an eight-team eight, uh, league. And, and you wonder why they had three managers, this was it. <laughs> and the, uh, the first man, I, I guess I should have mentioned that, uh, Cotton Knopp was a well-known minor league baseball player. And I think he played about 15 or 16 years with the New Orleans Pelicans as a shortstop. He was originally from uh, San Antonio, uh, you know, Texas. 
Uh, he eventually died over there, <clears throat> but uh, it seemed like every time he fielded a team over here, he was involved with it in some way, except for one year in 1827. And uh, like I say, Cotton was quite a player, and uh, you know, at the time, the Southern Association, you can make a living <clears throat> playing at the class that the Pelicans played at because it was one of the biggest cities in the country. And you didn't have to go all the way to New York or Chicago or at Northeastern Belleville, most of the major league teams were in those years. You, you could play baseball down here and make a fine living at it, and that's what he did, you know. I also found out in 1926, and this was interesting, the first experiments on television were done in that year. And they, uh, they sent a signal, I think it was from Washington, D.C., to uh, New York, and you could see it almost plain as day when I read about it. And of course, the radio was coming in at this time. And, uh, you know, later on, uh, like I said, this became a thing uh, as far as the major leagues and the minor leagues, like I said, it, you know, it, today, uh, the major league teams, I mean, most of their income, uh, besides, uh, uh, you know, attendance at the ballpark, it comes from television. So anyway, I went back to way back here. Anyway, I'll, I'll get into the next year, 1927, the, the Tarpons again. Yeah, the president was A.W. Lang. The secretary was E.M. Barber. <clears throat> and the manager was a man named Joe P. Doc Evans. And Evans is an interesting character. I was able to do a lot of research in him in the paper, and I found a lot more than I ever found anywhere by reading the newspapers accounts of this man. He was born here in Mississippi, became a professional baseball player, eventually moved to Dallas, Texas, and that's where he made his home before he came here. And uh, at the time the uh, Tarpons contacted him, he was uh, what you'd call the bench coach today for the St. Louis Browns. Now, if you've never heard of the St. Louis Browns, they had an up and down history. They were a power in the American League in, 19, in the 1920s, and by the 1930s they had begun to go into a skid. They came back about 1944 and won the World Series against the Cardinals in the same city that they played in. And by the 1950s, I mean, they were a doormat team and just about broke. And they eventually moved uh, in 1954 to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, where they're the Baltimore Orioles today. But anyway, Doc Evans left his position there as a, the right-hand man to the manager of the St. Louis Browns in 1927, came down here, and while he played in St. Louis, he had uh, gone to school at uh, Washington University in St. Louis and uh, taken a medical degree there. He was a, a, a medical doctor when he came here, and one of the reasons why he wanted to come here was he could set up a practice as well as play baseball. And, uh, <laughs> He did that. He also died here and years later, after well, long after the team had gone and all that. I guess he stayed on and uh, you know had his practice and all this stuff here, and he was completely happy. And he retired when uh, after the season with the <clears throat> the Tarpons. And I thought that was real interesting, you know. Anyway, the team in 1927, the first half under Evans, they won 31 and lost 29, and they came in third in an 18 league. In the second half, they won 26 and lost 35 and then came in fifth in the 18th league. And they played their games at the Gulfport Fairgrounds ballpark. It was also in this year, uh, talking about television years ago, they began the first experiments with nighttime baseball up in New England. They played a minor league game up there. They had uh, light standards around the infield. And I think they used some other type of apparatus in the outfield in order to light up the ballpark. And the first night game was played in that year. And if this team could have lasted uh, through the Depression and all of that, about 1931, that's when the Mobile Bears uh, first had their first night game. And that was a salvation for a lot of minor league baseball clubs, particularly in the, uh, with the Depression, and also major league clubs like the Cincinnati Reds and Brooklyn Dodgers went to that because they, they were on the financial ropes themselves there, and they, they thought they'd draw more fans, and they, they did. And this day and time, well, it's the only team that plays daytime baseball in this, this era is the Chicago Cubs, and even they play a few night games, you know. So. <laughs> but uh, you know, that was interesting, I thought. So this, this team, I think, was just uh, a few years ahead of its time, really. If it had been a little bit later, I think it might have became a, a money proposition. Maybe you could have made a go of it down here. And one of the things I remember reading uh, during this period of time, they had a comment in one of the Daily Herald articles that a team, in order to make it at this level of baseball, you had to have about 50,000 people in an area around there in order to draw enough people in the daytime and all of this to come see a baseball game. And uh, Gulfport at the time had about 14,000 people living here, and Biloxi about 16,000. So even with the two combined, if you had played a split schedule in both, you still wouldn't have had the type of population you needed to make a, a go of on the business side. So i tell you what these people were facing when they brought my league baseball into this area. 
Well, anyway, we'll go on to the 1928 Gulfport Tarquins, and this will be the last one. I'm still researching this year. I hadn't got into the Sun Herald yet, but when I do, I'm sure I'll find a lot more interesting tidbits and details like I did on this, this, these early two years. But anyway, the uh, president of the team at the time was also a man from the uh, Gulfport Athletic Association. His name was S.J. Bertusi. The secretary was uh, L.S. McCaleb. Uh, we got a we got a Patusa here. <laughs> no, we know. Although we know these names. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you might recognize him. Anyway, McCaleb, I think he may have been a Bucks in or a family from there originally, you know, because you know, that's a well-known name over there. They they own part of the property. The uh, ballpark I was talking about, Biloxi Point Conference, was located on. And the manager again was Henry Cotton Up. And the, the team that year, they won. 34 games, lost 21 games, and were second place in an eight-team league. The second half, they won 16, lost 44. The team fell completely apart and finished seventh in an eight-team league. And uh, they were playing again at the Gulfport Fairgrounds ballpark. And uh, some of the players of note <coughs> that played with these teams, I went through the uh, internet, because I, I shouldn't know anything about these ball players. Anyway, the uh, Society of American Baseball Research had done a lot of research on these different players and where they played and all that kind of thing. And they listed these people, so I took their names down. <clears throat> One of them was Arth Buck Collins. He was an outfielded pitcher for the 1906 Gulfport Crabs. And he played in 1904 with the New York Highlanders, and by 1915 they became what is known as the New York Yankees we know today. In 1909 he played with the Washington Senators. <coughs> and uh, that's kind of a funny situation up there. The original team was called the Washington Senators. They moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1961 and became the Minnesota Twins. They were replaced by an expansion club. They were also known as the, uh, the Washington Senators the next year. They played about a decade in Washington. Then they moved to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. They're known as the Texas Rangers today. And then the third club has come in. They're known as the Washington Nationals. They came in about five or six years ago from Montreal, uh, Canada. And uh, that's the third team of Washington in the 20 and 21st century. So when you talk about Washington baseball, you better know what area you're talking about, what team. <laughs> anyway, another player that played with his team was Hart Goodwin. He was a pitcher. He played with the 1907 uh, Gulfport Crabs and the 1905 uh, Highlanders. Uh, next, another man was Henry Jack Lively. He was a pitcher. He played with the 1906, 7, and 8 uh, Gulfport Crabs and Sand Crabs, so he was here the whole time. And in uh, 1911, he made it to the Detroit Tigers. Both of these players, they played a year or two in the major leagues and didn't go any further with it, but uh, I'll get into some later on. I mean, they had extensive major league careers that played down here. Uh, another one was Thomas Tom Riley. He was a shortstop. He, again, he played with all three teams here in Gulfport, 6, 7, and 8. By 1908, he had been called up to the St. Louis Cardinals and played with them through 1909. And by 1914, he was with the Cleveland Knaps. And by 1915, the uh, Cleveland Knaps became the Indians. The Knaps were a, a nickname the sports writers gave the team, and he, they were named hit at the time for their manager, Napoleon Lajewain. And um, by 1915, they became the Indians, but they had a, a well-known Indian player that was a star, and uh, the team uh, uh, changed the name uh, to honor him, you know, they've been, they've been the Indians ever since. Despite all aggravation you see in the papers about mm -hmm. mascot names and all that, it was an honor to, to name the team for this man, you know. Sokoli, I think, was his name. Another pitcher that played with the team was Jack Ryan. He was a pitcher. He was with the Gulfport Crabs in 6 and 07. He made it to the major leagues with Cleveland Knaps in uh, 1908 and also was traded the same year to the Brooklyn Dodgers, who are now in Los Angeles. And by 1909, he was with the Boston Red Sox. And uh, other players, this one particularly caught my eye. We get into the 1920s team, uh, the Gulfport Tarpons. Virgil Spud Davis, he was a catcher. He played with the 1926 Gulfport Tarpons. He made it to the Cardinals in St. Louis in 1928. He was traded to Philadelphia the Phillies in 1928. He stayed with the Phillies till 33. From 1933 to uh, 36, he was traded back to the St. Louis Cardinals. In 1937, he was traded to the Cincinnati Reds. He was back with the Phillies in 38-39. In 40 and 41, uh, he was with the team uh, I represented as captain of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And he came back after the war and played 44 and 45 with the Pirates. And he had a 16-year Major League career. 
the man I talked about earlier, uh, Joe P. Doc Evans, uh, he was a medical doctor, had an MD degree, graduated from Washington, Missouri uh, University. He uh, played with the 1927 Tarpons and retired at the end of the season and stayed here and, and, uh, with his medical practice. And he died here in Gulfport on July 28, 1954, at the age of 59, here in Gulfport. Anyway, he played with the uh, Tarpons in 1927, retired. Before that, he'd been with the Cleveland Indians in 1915 through 1922. He'd been with the Washington Senators in 1923. And he wound up his uh, major league career with the St. Louis Browns in 1924 and 25, and he was also a coach there with the team. And uh, as I mentioned, they became the Baltimore Orioles <clears throat> in 1954. Don Flynn, he was an out outfielder. He played with the Tarpons in 1926. And I think he was a player on the, on the, on the downhill side of his career when he played with Gulfport here. But, but in 1917, he played with the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates in the National League at the major league level. And uh, I talked about Henry Cotton Knopf. He played with the Gulfport Tarpons uh, in 1926 and 1928, and he retired as a player after the 1928 season. And he was with uh, the Cleveland Knops in 15, became the Indians in 1910 <coughs> and 1911. And he played shortstop for many years with the New Orleans Pelicans under the managership of uh, a great man called Larry Gilbert. Larry was uh, the brains uh, of, uh, of many of the New Orleans teams uh, in those years, and the, uh, the man that really ran the team, A.J. Hyman, uh, was the uh, secretary, I guess you'd call it, and he was in partnership with a man out of Cleveland, Ohio. Anyway, they feel it's a tremendous team <coughs> there between uh, World War I and World War II, and uh, Cotton Knopf was a shortstop for the most time apart. Knopf played in 11, 12, 13, 14, 19, 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23 with the Pelicans. Uh, he was a New Orleanian. <laughs> and the greatest of all the players that played here this man, Fred Dixie Walker. And uh, he played quite a bit of his career in Brooklyn. And up there, he was known as a people's choice. <laughs> he started out here with the Gulfport Tarpons as a rookie in 1928. And he played a few years in the minor leagues where he honed his skills. And by 1933, he made the, the New York Yankees roster. And he stayed with the Yankees through 1936. In 36 and 37, he was with the Chicago White Sox. In 38 and 39, he was with the Detroit Tigers. <clears throat> in 1939 and 1947, he was with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And buddy, he was a beloved player with them, one of the greatest, I guess, in the Brooklyn fans' eyes. And he wound up his career with the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1948-49. He had a 16-year major league career. So if anybody ever asks you whatever came out of these minor league teams in the board, you can talk about him and Joe Evans. I guarantee you they were two of the best, you know, and Cotton Off also. <laughs> anyway, I was going to tell you, I did a little bit of research. I was talking to Jane at the Biloxi Library. The Biloxi Group wanted to build a spring training headquarters uh, camp for what is Keith's Field today. And uh, there's an area, uh, the where the airstrip is today from the southwest and the northeast. Uh, that's the only one left at the field today. used to be another run the other direction. But anyway, at the extreme uh, northeast of the runway, there was a ballpark before Keesler Field was built in 1941. It had been put together by a group in Bluxy. And uh, they paid for it out of their own pocket for the most part, an athletic association type group over there. And uh, they called it the Bluxy Stadium. And, uh, I found uh, in the library, I was talking to Jane, this is a diagram, and I was very fortunate to come up with this. I wish I could do the same thing for the Gulf Coast Fairgrounds ballpark, but anyway, the architectural drawings for that place are still in existence, and this is them, you know. Anyway, the, this thing was unbelievable. It had a track and a football field, and one, one uh, file out here was 435 feet, the other was 456 feet. I don't know what center field must have been. It must have been about 500 feet or so. And nobody ever hit a, a ball out of this. <laughs> 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 it's like trying to play the cow pasture. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was built in 1927. And they had talked to the, uh, the Gulfport Tarpons about having a split schedule, schedule again. They're playing over there as a uh, you know, Gulfport Biloxi team. 
And I guess the, uh, the Gulf War team was having so many financial problems at the time, they didn't want to take the idea on. Anyway, by the time the park was built and in operation by 1928, uh, the, the talk was pretty much going out of the picture financially. So uh, anyway, the ballpark in time became the tra string of training headquarters for first the uh, Toledo Mud Hens of the American Association, which is the AAA minor league group today. Well, it's not today, it's, it's out of existence as far as organized baseball about 10, 15 years ago. But then came the Washington Senators, and they played the, there about five or six seasons. Then in 1938, Philadelphia Phillies uh, played there. And over at Gulfport, uh, they were a team playing at the uh, fairgrounds after the Tarpons had faded out of the picture. Uh, the Baltimore Orioles, who at that time were not in the American League, they were in a, a triple-A triple team or a double-A team in the International League. And also the Atlanta Crackers, I think, trained here. Uh, the uh, Albany Senators trained here. And I think the Milwaukee Brewers, who are not the major league team you know today, they were also an American association at the time. And as I told uh, Mr. Miller today, we were talking about the Detroit Tigers. They trained here before anybody from 1913, 14, and 15. And uh, one of the, uh, uh, the groundkeepers for the Tigers came down and had to supervise the uh, building of the field and one thing or another. I think, even though they had a field prior to that, I mean, they made it uh, to major league specifications at the time. And uh, the Tigers spent three years here. But unfortunately, after Detroit trained here, there was a major league uh, franchise, franchise that uh, trained in Gulfport. But you had bucos of uh, minor league teams. I know the uh, Atlanta Crackers trained here a couple of years in the 30s. And these teams were all, all playing against the Senators and the Phillies and all the rest of them around here at the time. <coughs> As I told Mr. Miller, I said, you can, you can draw the curtain down around World War II. I said, but all of passed, and I said, the minor leagues uh, pretty much went away and didn't come back in this area again. I said, we never, never saw professional baseball here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. As a young kid, I can tell you I saw it, but I had to go to Mobile to see it in New Orleans. And uh, the Mobile Bears were in business until about uh, 1961, I think it was, in the Southern Association. And the New Orleans Pelicans lasted until 19, uh, 1959. And then we had a revival here in the last few years of uh, the uh, Zephyrs came in from Denver, Colorado. They were a Triple A team after uh, the Colorado uh, joined the major leagues and took that franchise area. They came into uh, New Orleans about 1995. Then in 1997, we had a team come in from the Southern League that were called the Wilmington Roosters, and they came into Mobile and became the Mobile Bay Bears, we know today. And uh, we're about to get a team of our own down here in the same league with them. And uh, I don't know what they're going to be called yet. I think they're coming in from Huntsville. But uh, well, we're going to be a power in that league, believe me. I was telling Mr. Miller, I said, we've got about a half a million people living uh, in this uh, Sioux County area. And 15 million tourists coming in here. And there's nobody in that league even comes close to that total. I, said, I told the uh, man that did a study on that, Mr. Johnson, out of Chicago, when he came to the Biloxi City Council meeting. I said, Mr. Johnson, we only got to draw a small fraction of the 15 million, say 200,000. And I said, we're going to be one of the top of the drawing clubs in that league. So I'm waiting to see that happen. It's just around the corner. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm glad to you tonight. But anyway, that's the story of Gulfport, the professional baseball as I see it. And I'm still working on it right now. <laughs> <laughs>